Good morning, president, faculty, colleagues, dear students, and us uh, to our special then a special greeting to our panelists and special uh, guest speakers. Thank you for joining us today to celebrate the contribution of Asian, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders. My name is Xiang Kui Wong. I'm the provost of Hostos Community College. I'm a proud American, and I'm also a proud Asian American. I'm honored to join the president and panel uh, panels today to uh, and panel panels today to moderate today's um, but, uh, Balada Hastosiana. This is an event series sponsored by the Office of the President. Today's topic is the Chinese diaspora, transitional migration and integration in the Dominican society. Today's event is being recorded and the closed captioning is available on the screen. You can activate feature by clicking the CC live transcript button in the bottom of your screen. So now I have the honor to introduce our president, Dr. Daisy Coco de Phillips. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you this morning. And welcome to this edition of Eladas Ostosianas. It is good to see you all. This morning, we honor our Asian American Pacific Islanders, brothers and sisters, as we stand in solidarity and recognition of our common struggles, our common humanity, and our common need to make this a better world. For all. We are honored, we are so very honored to have with us a very, very distinguished friends of Ostos and wonderful colleagues who have made time from very busy schedules to join us, honor us, and delight us with their presence and comments. The Honorable U.S. Congresswoman Grace Mank will be joining us shortly, our distinguished state Senator John Liu who has been with us on many occasions, will be joining us as well. The absolutely superb and dynamic president of Queens College, Dr. Frank Wu is with us and former executive director of the Asian American Research Institute, Dr. Joyce May. In a minute, I'll talk about the two presenters. Um, I see the Senator is with us. Welcome Senator, great to see you. We have come together because May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And today's event is a celebration of the contributions made by Asians, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders here and around the world. It is a rich and vital legacy covering every conceivable discipline, practice and field of study. It is also a day to recognize and reject bigotry in whatever manifestation and whatever part of this world is in need of improvement. But today's topic of discussion is the Chinese diaspora, transnational migration and integration in the Dominican society by my good friend and colleague from CUNY, uh, uh, Dr. Luis Alvarez Lopez and, and, and a professor at Hunter College, and Sonia Bu Laranquent, educator and community and uh, organizer and someone whose work I have followed over the years. So I'm delighted to see her. It promises to be an illuminating and powerful presentation. Co-moderators, Shan Kui Guang, our Dr. Shan Kui Guang, the college provost, and Dr. Eric Radeski, our director of governmental and external affairs at Oslos, have assembled, as you can see, an outstanding group of guest speakers. Please join me in welcoming them and our moderators to this virtual forum. All right, so um, let me begin with our first uh, uh, guest here today, which is Senator John Liu, New York State Senator John Liu. Uh, he represents a section of Northeast Queens. He is the chairperson of the Senate's Committee on New York City Education and also serves on the Budget and Revenue Committee, Education Committee, Finance, Higher Education, Rules and Transportation Committees. Uh, Senator Liu was a New York City Council member from 2002 to 2009, and New York City Comptroller from 2010 to 2013. Held as a trailblazer and pioneer, Senator Liu's historic elections as the first right, Asian. Right. Thank you. I like to <laughs> brag you about you, Senator Liu. Thank you for the arrangements. And I want to thank President DeFilippis for leading this effort once again, and these distinguished panelists that we have on this in this very special event, uh, Hostos, 
initiated this last year in the face of this uh, unbelievable onslaught of anti-Asian hate that we saw here in New York City, unfortunately, and across the country. And, uh, and at the time, you know, we had just seen this massacre where eight people were shot dead in Atlanta and continuing vicious attacks against Asian Americans. And I think we all kind of like thought or maybe hoped that we'd seen the worst of it. Uh, but unfortunately, it has continued for yet another year where we thankfully have not seen the, the horrific shootings like we did last spring. But we still see people, you know, being killed in the worst ways, a young Asian woman being pushed onto an oncoming train, which is like the every New Yorker's worst nightmare, to uh, another young Asian woman being followed into her apartment and then stabbed to death 40 times. Uh, uh, you know, whether, whether these specific incidents were labeled as hate crimes or not, uh, as an Asian American, I, I, I think it can speak for, for many of us. And I think Congressmember Meng would concur that uh, we feel the hate, no matter what the legalistic uh, labels are, we feel it. And so it's, it's just important for Asian Americans to not be invisible in any way. And that's been part of the problem. We've, we've kind of been invisible from, uh, you know, from people in the community, in our society, and in, from my perspective, most importantly, invisible in the eyes of government. And so we've undertaken a variety of measures that will take the invisibility away, everything from securing budgetary resources for community-based organizations so that they can strengthen the infrastructure in our community so that individuals don't feel so vulnerable to uh, pursuing education about Asian Americans in our public schools and beyond, to requiring or demanding that law enforcement be, uh, be more energetic and vigorous in holding attackers accountable to recognizing that there are mentally ill and homeless people who need more resources. And we've, we've uh, tried to attack the problem from all points of view. But uh, it is just as important for our institutions and organizations such as Hostos and such as the rest of CUNY I see our great friend, uh, Frank Wu. He's one of the few people that I have more hair than, uh, even though we're about the same age. Uh, but in any event, you know, we, these kinds of forums help take away that invisibility and therefore uh, make us all a little bit less vulnerable. So I, I really want to thank all of you for taking part in this. I want to thank the people who are watching this. And uh, once again, Daisy, thanks for your tremendous leadership in at Hostos and far beyond. All right. And uh, thank you, Senator Liu. I see we've been joined by Congresswoman Grace Meng. Um, I'll read a brief bit of her bio here. Grace Meng represents the 6th Congressional District of New York, including West Central and Northeast Queens. She is the first and only Asian American member of Congress from New York State. Uh, Congresswoman Meng is a member of the powerful House Appropriations Committee, which is responsible for funding every federal agency program and project in the United States, and is vice chair of the Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations. She also sits on the Appropriations Subcommittee on Agriculture and the Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies. She has passed several pieces of legislation into law, including striking Oriental from federal law, and in addition, she has fought to expand opportunities for communities of color, young people, and women, and has secured resources to help small local businesses. Uh, prior to serving in Congress, uh, Grace Meng was a member of the New York State Assembly, and before entering public service, she worked as a public interest lawyer. Congresswoman Meng, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, would you like to say anything before we get started with the questions? Um. I'm in the middle of votes, so I don't want to prolong. Um, if the bio sounds impressive, that's because we wrote it ourselves. So I feel like we included some good stuff already. 
Um, <laughs> but thank you to Daisy and thank you to everyone part of the Hostos and CUNY family for including me and Senator Lou today. Um, really grateful for this opportunity. I may run in and out because of votes, but I'll come right back. Okay, thank you. We understand. Very important. Um, all right, so uh, the first question, and this is to both uh, the Congresswoman and the Senator. Uh, what types of anti-Asian crimes have you seen in your community? You Want to go first, Grace, or? Um, sure. Um, well, Senator Liu mentioned a couple of the incidents that we have seen uh, here in New York City. You know, this is something that has been happening for about two years now. Uh, it really, uh, the numbers really skyrocketed after the former president was using such harmful and dangerous language, um, literally putting a target on the backs of, of our community. I think one of the first um, incidents we saw was um, in our home district of Flushing, Queens, where um, an Asian American uh, mom was pushed to the ground uh, outside of a Flushing bakery and um, a man was uh, shouting racial slurs at her. Um, and, I, and I do wanna commend uh, our local DA because at first glance, uh, there weren't really witnesses or evidence that was brought forth to prove that hateful and discriminatory language was being used. Um, but in a deeper investigation through email and phone records showed that this man really uh, had a long practice, long time practice of using discriminatory language. And so that's what, you know, to, to John's point about not being invisible, um, that's really at the base of, of what we're pleading for, that people take these incidents against our uh, community seriously. And that incident, for example, did not result in death, but cases throughout uh, the past two years and as we uh, come upon, you know, the, as we are uh, commemorating this one year anniversary of um, the eight people shot to death in Atlanta, six of them were Asian American women. Um, our community is terrified to go outside, literally to leave the house, to ride public transit. Um, and we are happy that people are finally starting to listen to our concerns um, because we have been speaking up for a long time. It's just that people haven't cared enough to pay attention. Yeah, and, and I represent a portion of Congressman Romang's district, so we have a lot of common constituents. We, we've all seen the headline making, the horrific attacks against Asian Americans, some, Americans, some, uh, some being fatalities and others being violent assaults and others just being, you know, abhorrent uh, and despicable. So you have moms being attacked. We have, you know, last year we Late last year, we had a, a woman sweeping her sidewalk outside her home. And just out of nowhere, a guy comes up and slams her in the head with a huge rock. She, you know, she was put into a coma and unfortunately she died a few months later. We had a, a guy who was uh, just collecting cans, trying to support uh, his family. He had been laid off from from a business that had that had been a victim of the COVID economic crisis, and uh, just again attacked out of nowhere, and uh, and spent months in the hospital, and again unfortunately died, eventually died. Uh, so you know, the, all there's been so many newspaper articles, too many, and and TV news reports about these horrific crimes. But there are also so many other attacks and incidents that don't necessarily make the news. Uh, thankfully, we actually have social media now where people are more willing to post their experiences. So it includes everything from, uh, from you know, as I said before, stupid gestures and comments, you know, uh, people moving away from you on a bus or a subway just because you're Asian. The implication is that they don't wanna catch something from you or you see somebody walking down the street and you know they intentionally like cross the street once they 
catch sight of you. The the uh, you know the, a, a new anti Asian slur is now carrier. When you get called a carrier, that that um, that implies something, and it's in large part due to what Grace said that you know that Trump kept calling this the China virus or the Kung flu, even though public policy advisors had uh, continued to implore him not to use that term. So this is uh, this is this is the reality that we're we're coping with. The second question I wanted to ask is something that you already started to address, Senator, which is uh, why are hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders happening now? Um, if there's anything else you want to add or Congresswoman Meng, do you have any thoughts? Um, no, I think we addressed a lot of that, um, but I, I do want to mention something that Senator Liu is working on in the state um, about education. You know, we have grown up, uh, I was born and raised in New York and really have not seen enough in our textbooks and curriculum about Asian Americans' contributions to this country, how we literally helped build this country, how Japanese American citizens were treated uh, during World War II. Um, the good and the bad. And so we want to make sure that more people are learning about our history um, because too many people, and even in New York and across the country, still view us as foreigners and people who are not truly American. And that's one reason why Trump's you know, insightful language made it even easier. He wasn't necessarily introducing new feelings he was sort of giving permission and emboldening people who already harbor these um, racist and discriminatory uh, thoughts and kind of gave them permission to, to carry them out. And we've seen how harmful this impact is. Yeah, and to answer your question, Eric, about why this is happening, I mean, this is, there's, there's no question that the, 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 the anti-Asian hate came just right alongside, hand in hand with the COVID pandemic. And people, you know, people blaming China and by extension, anybody who looks like they might be from China with the, uh, the, uh, the former president's incendiary comments all the time. Uh, that definitely directly contributed and I would say caused the onslaught of anti-Asian hate uh, that combined with the need to find some kind of reason or blame because people were afraid. And when people are afraid, they need some kind of answer. And, you know, oftentimes they point to uh, the, the, the mystery. And the mystery in this case is the, these Asian Americans that people just unfortunately don't know a whole lot about. Last year, there was a poll of 2000 Americans conducted asking them, you know, if they know an Asian American. And only 42% of those 2,000 people could identify even a single Asian American. The most common response was Jackie Chan. <laughs> you know, I like Jackie Chan. It's kind of goofy, but I, you know, I get entertained. But the guy's not Asian American. He's from Hong Kong. And the second most common response was Bruce Lee. I'm also a Bruce Lee fan, but the guy's been dead for 30 years. And, you know, it was just, it just laid bare how little people understood about Asian Americans, which is why they can, as Grace said, label us as, as these foreigners or these, you know, we call it the perpetual foreigner syndrome. Or if, if they, you know, if they actually have some kind of contact with Asians, they, they, they label us as model minority. It's like one street and one extreme perpetual foreigner or model minority, model minority being you know, everybody's rich and smart and they don't need anything from, from us. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a symptom or I should say a consequence of the lack of attention and, uh, and priority given to Asian Americans by government. All right, uh, the next question, and maybe this will be a two-part question. Uh, how have you responded to these hate crimes and have you introduced any legislation to address the issue? And this, this is to both of our elected officials. Mm -hmm. um, I can start, you know, in the early days when we were seeing some of this dangerous language being used, 
I started first by talking privately to some of my colleagues, like the Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, and I begged him not to use that language that he used first on Twitter. He barely listened to what I had to say and, and walked away. And we realized quickly that private pleas weren't going to help and that they were just gonna to continue to use uh, insightful language. Um, we put forth a resolution that um, you know, condemned for Congress to condemn anti-Asian hate and discrimination, especially related to COVID. And one thing that I will say along the way is that whether it was pushing legislation or showing up at vigils and rallies, one of the best things that we've seen that has increased during these last two years is the solidarity between our communities, because it wasn't just Asian Americans who were showing up at these rallies. It was people from all different backgrounds and not even just in areas with large Asian populations. I remember my colleagues and friends were having uh, anti-Asian hate rallies in places like Maine and, and New Hampshire, right? Not places that you would automatically think of. And so I think that the solidarity that is being built and expanded is, is something that will be really impactful and long lasting. Um, one legislation I pushed was the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. Um, it was born out of conversations with uh, many community activists who really were at the front lines. For example, if you know of a group, Stop AAPI Hate, you might not have known them before, but you know them now because they were pretty much the only ones that were keeping track of what was happening across the country. Our federal government, um, much like it was in the past with gun violence, our federal government does not collect statistics on hate crimes or bias incidents. So most police law enforcement jurisdictions um, report zero hate crimes, uh, reported zero hate crimes in 2020. And we all know that that is not true as great it, as it would be. So we need them to take uh, the reporting and the investigation uh, a lot more seriously. We need them through this bill as it's implemented to allow people to report in multiple languages and in an easier way. Um, and this is not, you know, a magic pill, one-stop answer uh, to combating this hate. Um, we're also working on education to help break down the stereotypes that too many people have uh, about our AAPI communities. Um, working on issues like education uh, with leaders like Senator Liu. Um, we passed uh, on our side a, a museum bill to have the very first step in a probably long process uh, in building a museum so that people within and beyond the API community would understand and, and learn about uh, our community's contributions and what we've gone through uh, in this country. Yeah, I'll briefly add to that, that it, on the state level here in New York, uh, we've also pursued legislation that requires Asian American studies to be taught in public schools. We actually passed a related bill in the state Senate uh, education committee so far that requires some uh, culturally sustainable, I'm sorry, culturally sustaining and responsive education in public schools. Even that got some uh, pushback from uh, members of the Senate from the other side of the aisle. But we're going to keep pushing, and 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 beyond that, we're also providing a, a great deal more resources, financial resources for community-based organizations, so that they can provide appropriate levels of service uh, to the AAPI community throughout New York. And, um... I'm not sure what the, our Congress member's schedule is because she's in and out of votes now. Uh, but I'm going to have to depart at 1130, but we'll, uh, we'll watch the recording to see what our professors and distinguished academics have to say. Okay. Um, well, I know that the Congresswoman also has to uh, run in a moment. I'll just throw out one last quick question, which is that uh, what can the average person who's watching this program today do to, uh, to help or to be supportive of the AAPI community in these times? I think that there is a diverse spectrum of what people 
think are the solutions to this problem. It's a very complex problem. We're not going to solve it overnight. But one thing we have to ensure, and some people don't like when I say this, that we cannot scapegoat other communities for the attacks. The only way that we move forward is by moving forward together. We have to understand that many people showed up for our community and not just Asian Americans, and they've been consistently showing up when we're working on budget, when we're working on legislation, curriculum, it's not just Asian Americans, legislators who are standing up um, with us. And so we need to make sure that our community is calling out racism um, that's targeted at our community and racism that exists within our communities. Um, there are certain media outlets that only call out the race of an attacker if they are black or Hispanic. Um, and people get mad at me when I call them out to say that too, but we have to be consistent and we have to be fair. And so it's really hard to have these conversations. And a lot of this falls on the burden falls on our shoulders, right? Like our parents and our grandparents generation don't necessarily have the tools or resources to be able to have these conversations and to expand these coalitions. Um, and so it really falls on our shoulders to create opportunities just like the ones we're having today where we get to um, go outside of our silos, sometimes self-created, and to really think of ways that we can uh, combat hate um, together. Yeah, I mean, our fellow human beings who may not happen to be AAPI, by the way, AAPI stands for Asian American slash Pacific Islander. Somehow that's the federal description of our community. Um, I find very few people know that acronym, AAPI, but uh, which is why I usually say Asian American, but that's the term AAPI. And uh, if you're not AAPI, you know, I, I, I would ask you to, if you, you, you see or, or hear somebody say something ridiculous or make a gesture or heaven forbid, engage in some kind of uh, conduct that's, that's dangerous, uh, please say something. If, if you feel it's safe to do so, please say something. Uh, you can interrupt these kinds of incidents, not necessarily by, uh, by confronting the offender, but simply just injecting yourself, like asking the, the victim target, you know, how's it going? You know, what do you think of the Mets? Not the Yankees, the Mets. And, uh, you know, what do you, you know, it looks like we have a good weekend coming up. So there are lots of things that call, you know, this is bystander intervention that can be done safely. Uh, and, and also, you know, try to learn something about the Asian American community beyond the completion of the railroads, the internment camps, camps during World War II, what happened after 9-11, the attacks and racism against the South Asian community. Uh, and, you know, Google a few Asian Americans so that if you ever get asked who's, a, who's an Asian American that you know, it's not gonna be Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan. And to, uh, to my fellow Asian Americans, I would say, uh, in more explicit terms, what Congressmember Meng was diplomatically conveying, which is, you know, I hear comments from from Asian Americans, like, you know, why do blacks hate us so much? And somehow that's the solution to uh, to directly address the fact that many of these attackers on video look like they're black. Well, number one, the statistics show that actually that's not the case, that the, the vast majority of attacks and incidents against AAPI members in the last couple of years are not African-American or Latinx people. And number two, uh, you know, if we don't want people to be racist against us, <laughs> let's not engage in racism in any way on our part. People say, Asian Americans say, well, the videos don't lie. Actually, the videos don't show the whole truth. And if you, you know, again, racism and hate is based in ignorance. If you want to play that game, if you want to remain ignorant as an Asian American and spew hate among other people onto other people, then that's your fault. And don't blame anybody 
when you face racism yourself. So I've got that message to uh, fellow non-AAPI human beings and uh, fellow human beings who are AAPI. All right, thank you, Senator Liu, Congresswoman Meng. I know you both have to run, but we really appreciate you being here with us at Hostos for this event. Uh, thank you once again. It's great to see you. Go Hostos. Uh, see and you on the Grand Concourse. With that, I will turn it back over to our provost, who will continue with the next segment. Thank you, Eric, and um, thank you, Congresswoman Grace uh, Grace Ben Feng Zhaowen and Senator Jiang Liu, Liu Chen Yi for joining us today and share your wisdom and advice. Thank you for advocate, advocating and supporting Asian American as always. Uh, next, I want to introduce our panelist, Executive Director Joyce, Joyce Moy and President Frank Wu. We also have prepared some questions for our panelists. And if audience, if uh, you have any questions, please submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will answer these questions at the end. Uh, so now let me briefly introduce our uh, guest speakers. Joyce Moy, she is the executive director of the Asian American Asian Research Institute of CUNY. Her field of expertise is economic development and entrepreneurship. She is a professor of entrepreneurship in the Master of Science in Business and Leadership Program at CUNY. Joyce is also a former practicing attorney. She has many, many, many accomplishments. I also want to point out that um, she is a recipient of numerous awards, including the New York Women's Chamber of Commerce Women of Excellence Award. Next speaker is President uh, Frank Wu. Frank Wu serves as the 11th president of Queens College. Prior to joining the CUNY system, Frank served as the chancellor and dean and then uh, William Prosser, Distinguished Professor at the University of California, Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco. He was a member of the faculty at Howard University for a decade. And Howard University is the nation's leading historically black college university. So uh, welcome President Wu and Executive Director Moy. So uh, the first question is for both of you. Some of the victims of these hate crimes are living in isolation and don't know uh, how to, uh, where to find the resources or help. So how can we reach those individual, individuals proactively and inform them that there are available resources from the mayor's office or from the community? Well, um, if, I, if I may start, um, one of the things that's really important and actually Senator Liu made reference to this is that there needs to be appropriate amounts of funding for social service organizations, community-based organizations that serve the AAPI community. Up until recently, there has been underfunding of all of our organizations. Um, and so we need to bring that up, be consistent with it, make sure that these are not just one-off funding, uh, funding uh, opportunities, but that we have all of this funding built into the line items so that they are consistently funded over a long period of time going into the future. Without this resource, um, we are really unable to reach our communities and provide the kinds of services that are needed to sustain and help protect these communities. Thank you. Uh, Frank, do you have anything you wanna add? It's so important to reach out. So many of the victims here are elderly. They're elderly women in particular. Uh, they're especially vulnerable. Uh, and I'll uh, note, uh, just to back up for a moment, building on the comments of our uh, leaders, one of the issues here is some people, even now, say to me, well, how do you know that's a hate crime? How do you know that's racial? Maybe it's just random. Maybe it's a troubled person. And, you know, I'll be honest, do I know that it's a hate crime in every instance based on a video? No, I don't. But when you see enough of these viral videos, there's a pattern. And even if you don't know in one case, you look at this and you have to say, this isn't random. There's something happening here. Then when you listen carefully, you realize, wait a minute, they're shouting racial slurs. They're saying, go back to where you came from. They're saying this disease is your fault. Those are all things that are based on the color of skin, the texture of hair, the shape of eyes. So maybe you can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is a 
bigot through and through, but race is an element here. And sometimes someone isn't a bigot through and through, but they're feeling stress. They've had a they've been laid off from their job. They've had one drink too many and something happens and this pours out. And maybe most of the time they're a good and decent person, but when they get riled up, especially with the rhetoric, and they see someone Asian, then they just snap. In one of the videos, you've probably seen this, I can't recommend it to you because it's just too terrible to look at. The, the woman is knocked to the ground, kicked in the head repeatedly so much, you know, I, I don't want people to think this is just a a little thing, right? These are folks that they have to go to the hospital in critical condition. They fall into comas. They die from from what's happened. In that video, you probably saw this from a year ago. At the very end, as brutal as that attack is, the shocking part is at the end, there are two burly doormen who have watched the whole scene. And they literally, they go and they close the door, they turn around, and they walk away. Well, the perpetrator apparently was a felon, but those two doormen were bystanders who did not become upstanders. So it's so important to, to reach out to those who are isolated, just to, to check on them, to say, are you doing okay? And these are folks who are already isolated because of language and because of poverty. So anything that, that we can do to check on folks is just so important. And we can do that even if you're a stranger. As Senator Liu said, all it takes for intervention is for you to say something, anything. And that sometimes is enough to stop the attack. Thank you, Frank. The next question, uh, I'll begin with you, uh, Frank. Do you see any connection or uh, commonalities between the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and anti-Semitic hate crimes? A absolutely. You know, it's so difficult for Asian Americans to raise these issues, and the the violence uh, is is not actually new. The awareness of it is new, uh, and thank goodness there's there's finally outreach and bridge building. You know, you don't have to be of Asian descent to be troubled. That's the other aspect of this. This isn't some sort of special pleading by Asian Americans. There is no culture in which it is appropriate to knock an elderly woman to the ground deliberately. That is wrong. You can be white, black, Latino. You can be anybody and look at that and say, whoa, that is bad conduct and, and we need to catch the perpetrator. So uh, I think it's very much related. The images of Jews in Western culture, like the images of Asian Americans, I think there are three commonalities. The first is, we tend to talk about race as if everyone is literally black or white and nobody else matters. Now, I want to be clear. I'm all about bringing us into the picture to help, not to harm, the historic struggle for black equality. And as Congresswoman Meng said, it's not right just to say African Americans are doing this because it's not right because it's not accurate. Uh, and it's not right because this is about bridge building. It's about ideals and principles and bringing communities together. But one of the reasons for Jews and for Asian Americans it's hard to, to be heard is people think, well, who are you? You're, you're, you're not actually who we're thinking about when we talk about civil rights. But that's the problem. Second issue is this perpetual foreigner idea. You know, there are seventh generation Asian Americans. They're Asian Americans whose parents are white because they're adopted. They're Asian Americans whose ancestors came on the Mayflower. Now, when I say that, people are puzzled. It's because they're Anglo-Asian. It's mixed marriages, right? And there are people, they're assimilated, they're Christian, they're as American as can be. They've never been to Asia. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with being fresh off the boat. That used to be a pejorative phrase. It's been reclaimed because of the hit TV show. But what happens is everyone assumes, oh, come on, you're not really one of us. And so you don't have any rights. Why should we care? Why should we listen to your complaints? You could always go back to where you came from. Well, for me, that's Detroit. That's where I grew up. I was born in the United States. And yet the assumption is I somehow am an outsider. But the third thing is this model minority myth. Uh, let me expand on what that is. That's the idea. Whiz kid, rocket scientists, crazy rich Asians, perfect SAT scores, live in the suburbs, no problems. You know, 
you're a model. What do you have to complain about? Even though statistically Asian Americans have a wider uh, socioeconomic gap, more disparities than any other racial or ethnic group, any other. And that's because there are, is more than one flow. Yes, there are crazy rich Asians. But there are also those who work in the all-you-can-eat seafood buffet or who are rideshare uh, drivers. And so what happens with this model minority myth is it ratchets up resentment. How come the Asians are taking over? Why, why do they get all the scholarships to school and win every spelling bee and science fair? Where are the real Americans? And, and that's the same image that's behind anti-Semitism. So there are common themes. Uh, Jews historically viewed as outsiders no matter what and viewed as too successful for their own good, right? It's a sense that you're all privileged. So absolutely, there are commonalities. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Joyce, do you have anything you want to add? Well, you know, the, uh, I myself am the fourth generation of my family in the United States. Uh, my great-grandfather, grandfather, and father were excluded from becoming U.S. citizens because they were born in China. And just imagine, with respect to European Americans, when they're here less than one generation, they will be viewed as Americans. Somebody like me is told to go back to China. My children are fifth generation. My grandchildren are sixth generations of, of our family in the United States being told to go back to China. So this forever foreign um, uh, pejorative term uh, really does apply today. Um, and, and it's constant. It's not something that happens uh, only occasionally. There was a study that was released recently over the last couple of days that said that 33% of those that were surveyed believed that Asians were more loyal to their countries of origin than to the United States. When I hear something like that, I am frightened because that is exactly what led to the roundup of Japanese Americans and the internment camps. People who were lawyers who had, had pledged um, their loyalty to the US Constitution, uh, people who had served in the military, who had, born, had been born in the United States, regardless of what their background was, were rounded up and put into these internment camps. This happens to be uh, 2022 is the 80th anniversary of the executive order um, that was issued by the president during the World War to round up Japanese Americans. It is also the 140th anniversary of the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which, the, which created a situation where my ancestors could not become US citizens. That in fact, stunted the growth of Asian Americans in terms of civic participation. We were not seen as American. We were not allowed to participate. Our immigration to the United States was essentially stopped. And I can tell you that even my generation, which was born here, thought of ourselves as Chinese, not as American, because Americans didn't allow us to think of ourselves as Americans. And it is only recently over the past several decades that civic engagement in our communities has really um, started to grow. And so the impact of these exclusionary acts um, and these, these um, outright despicable acts has caused a slowing down of civic engagement of, on the part of the longer uh, term or, or, or the long timers uh, with respect to the Asian American community. So there, there really is um, a, a huge impact. Uh, and as Frank mentioned, you know, the hate crimes against Asians has been going on for several decades, starting with 9-11, where again, our South Asian um, communities were attacked because, they, because of Muslim heritage or perceived Muslim heritage. Um, the, again, the other thing that scares me is this report also said that 20% of those surveyed believe that Asians are at least partially responsible for COVID in this country. I say to you that it is the failure of American leadership that caused the death of a million people in this country, regardless of where the, the disease emanated from. It is the failure of American leadership. And that just brings me to one final point. This is also the 40th anniversary of the killing of Vincent Chin. This was a young 27 year old Chinese American who was out celebrating his upcoming marriage. He was killed by two 
automaker, auto workers, because they thought he was Japanese and they blamed the Japanese for stealing the auto, uh, auto workers' jobs. Well, again, it was the failure of American business leadership in not making sure that our auto industry was competitive that caused them to lose jobs. So there is this attempt always to disavow responsibility and to scapegoat people. And the easiest people to scapegoat are those that are perceived as being other or being you know, um, perpetual foreigners. Thank you, Joyce. The next question, I will start with you, Joyce. Uh, you have a long history with AAARI. And for audience, uh, if you don't know what AAARI is, it's Asian American slash Asian Research Institute. So uh, you have a long history with AARI. Did you notice individual proposing research topics on hate crimes? And does this represent a change from topics of years past? Well, you know, I, as, as um, Congresswoman Meng mentioned, a collection of data with respect to hate crimes has only really started, although there is a history of attacks on the Asian American community, um, massacres, lynchings, and so forth. But most recently, I have seen greater efforts at collecting data. And there has been research around the issue, including that report that I just mentioned about the American uh, perception of Asian Americans and the underlying causes of hate. Um, also, just to clarify a, a few things, I stepped down as the executive director of, of ARI, the Asian American Asian Research Institute on March 31st, but I'm also happy to report that I continue to engage with the organization. Thank you, Joyce. Frank, you're relatively new to AARI. What about you? Do you have anything else you want to add? Many congratulations to Joyce Moy. ARI will be having uh, its gala soon, and it's a CUNY-wide institute uh, housed at Queens College administratively. We look forward to upgrading and expanding it. Education is so important. And that education can simply be to explain the facts. You know, there's a lot of backlash these days when you try to talk about these issues. People say, well, you know, uh, you're, you're raising controversy. And I'm always very puzzled because so much of this is just fact. I'll give you an example. It is a fact that in 1882, Congress passed an Exclusion Act, and it's a fact that it targeted the Chinese alone by race. And then it's also a fact in 1917 that was expanded to an Asiatic barred zone. This is not fake news. It's well established. Nobody really could dispute that these things happened. The internment of Japanese Americans, 120,000 people, two thirds of them United States citizens. It happened. The killing of Vincent Chin. You know, one of the crazy, terrible aspects of that case is the murderers never denied. They always admitted they killed him. They couldn't deny it. There were dozens of witnesses. They pled guilty. Yet they then turned around and said that they were victims of a claim that they, they were prejudiced in the Atlanta killing. The murderer immediately confessed. So there's no doubt. There, this is not a dispute. Did he kill eight people? He did. He said he did. There's no dispute. Six of the eight were Asian women. There's no dispute. He drove around looking for them. Yet the law enforcement officer investigating the case said after he had confessed, oh, he was having a bad day. I saw that and I thought, well, that's got to be fake news. What cop says of the confessed murderer rather than the victims that he was having a bad day? But indeed, that's what that law enforcement officer said until he was removed from the case. So to just educate people and to show them the commonalities. This is not just about Asian Americans, just as to learn about Black history, Latino history, Native history, that's important for all of us because when you add it all up, that's American history. Thank you, Frank. The next question, um, what role can Hostos Community College, Queens College, AARI and others play in supporting students against these types of hate crimes and building so, uh, solidarity with other minority, minority groups that are often targeted. 
Well, if I may, first, let me thank Ostos and particularly the president for her leadership, um, the solidarity, the opportunity to demonstrate what allyship looks like really comes from forums and activities like this. Reaching out to students and understanding what their concerns are, uh, bringing in people from all of the different communities to talk to students. Because, you know, within CUNY, one of the things I have found is that if we don't expand the orbit of the students in terms of who they encounter, there are many opportunities that are missed. So again, opportunities for students from various backgrounds to meet students from other backgrounds, to expose them to leaders within the community from all of the various backgrounds. That is, is really important. You know, I particularly appreciated President uh, Coco de Phillips' um, statement uh, when uh, the anti-Asian hate uh, issue started to really surface in the news, et cetera. And that is exactly what we need, that demonstration of solidarity and allyship. And again, I really do want to thank Osos and its leadership for its extraordinary um, attention to this issue. Thank you, Joyce. Brent? Yeah, there's also a great history of collaboration that we never talk about. I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples. When Malcolm X was shot, look at Life Magazine. That was the Instagram of its time, the pictorial news magazine. And the photos, you know, as he is dying, drawing his last breaths at the Audubon Ballroom in New York City, it's 1963. You look at the photo, there is an Asian American woman in all the photos, cradling his head. And people have wondered, well, who is that? That was one of his closest confidants. She was not some passerby. That was Yuri Kochiyama, an Asian American who was part of the struggle for black liberation because she was inspired. That's an example. Here's another example. Nobody knows about this unless you are a scholar and have studied uh, the history of Asian Americans of the labor movement. In 1903, one of the very first multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, moments in labor history occurred in Oxnard, California. It was a beat strike. It was Mexican and Japanese laborers who harvested beets. And this was at a time when labor unions uh, expressly uh, had ethnic exclusion and uh, where uh, employers uh, had a divide and conquer uh, strategy uh, to, to have different groups competing against each other. But uh, the Mexican workers and the uh, Japanese workers, all immigrant workers, migrant workers, they came together and they created a Japanese-Mexican Labor Association in 1903, before we talked about diversity, before we talked about multiculturalism. That is important, fascinating history. And to have students write papers on, on that sort of thing, it, it can all be projected forward. So. Sometimes we, we think, well, all this is new, this idea of multiculturalism, et cetera. It's not. Uh, this goes back more than 100 years, but it's always just been pushed to the margins. Those margins are making a new mainstream. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question, uh, Congresswoman Min and Senator Liu addressed this a little bit uh, about this topic, but I just want to ask if you have anything you want to add. So what factors have, have contributed to the increase in AAPI hate crimes? Well, again, I, I think that the rhetoric uh, that was used, particularly by former President Trump, uh, calling this Kung Fu, calling this the China virus, uh, definitely opened the doors, giving people permission to um, treat Asians as, as outsiders. Um, there, there's no doubt about that. And again, the resentment um, in terms of the economic um, slide that people experience in this country, looking again for scapegoats and saying that other people are the cause of what's happening, again, deflecting the responsibility from the failure of our leadership. When I was a kid and I faced on the playground, the common cruelty of childhood, the sort of teasing and taunting, 
The adults who looked on and did nothing said, Ah, oh, just reply, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And even as a kid, I was skeptical about that for a couple of reasons. First, because the words lead to the sticks and stones. These aren't just words, they're fighting words. I'm actually a supporter of free speech. I think uh, we need to use words in favor of diversity and against racism. But words have a power. And that's the second reason that I was skeptical of, of what folks would say, because those words, they pack their own punch. You know, kids can survive all sorts of physical trauma. They fly off a swing set and, and knock teeth out or break their arm, and they have high fevers, and they, they withstand things that adults couldn't. But they carry with them forever that psychic trauma of the constant microaggressions, and you always have to be alert because that's the other aspect of this it starts with just name calling right but as you're walking down the street minding your own business and someone calls you a chink a jap or a gook and i use those words to show they have no power over me you try to move a little faster but you don't know if then they're going to do something spit on you take out a knife do something worse because it starts with those words and then it escalates and yes yeah, some people are troubled souls right they they have mental issues and, and they need help. But what happened is because of this rhetoric, they were given license, they were encouraged. And there are people who should have known better, who again and again and again, stirred up the anger. And the pandemic was terrible. But the pandemic is not the fault of Joyce Moy or Grace Mang or John Liu or me, or someone who happens to have an Asian face who may well be American, who has nothing to do with Wuhan or a virus. Thank you so much. I have the one last question for the both of you. What are the challenges of building alliances between AAPI and Latinx or African-American communities? One of the things that, that I would say is that part of it is the nature of our communities, right? In New York City, 71% of the Asian American community is foreign born. And members of any immigrant community knows that the number one focus is trying to put food on the table and to provide for one's family. So there may be uh, less civic engagement. Many of the Asians, for example, come to the United States after having seen lots of exported negative information about the African-American community, the Latino community, and so on. And so they bring this overly exaggerated um, negative image along with them, and they have not experienced um, you know, uh, neighborhoods and friends and colleagues from these other communities. So these kinds of things do add to the situation. And mind you, as time goes on, we're seeing this happen in more and more other communities. For example, approximately a third of New York City's black community is foreign born. And they too are often puzzled by some of the things that they, they see, although many of them also do understand the, the, um, the influence of the colonial uh, thinking that infuses a lot of what happens in, in this country. So that is one of the things that makes it difficult. But I am seeing, particularly among the younger generation of Asian Americans, greater and greater understanding that the solidarity is absolutely needed. You know, we have Asians for Black Lives Matter. We see that the South Asian Americans uh, leading together has formed a group for, uh, called South Asians for Black Lives everybody's beginning to understand that we are walk, that we have all walked along some segment of the same path to becoming American. I mean, I try to call these things out as well. I am old enough to remember when John Kennedy ran for president and people questioned whether he was loyal to the United States or to the Pope because he was Catholic. You know, and, and so when you don't know that history and you forget that history, it's very easy to ignore what's happening to newcomers or new groups that are, are facing these kinds of issues. You know, I'll be brutally honest. Um, from time to time, people say to me, hey, Wu, 
when are you going to stand up for Asian Americans against black people? I think to myself, all right, I stand up for Asian Americans every single day. But framing it that way is not principled and it's not pragmatic and it's just going to make everything worse, right? You always have a choice when you face issues. Do, do you make it better or you make it worse? What do you think would happen if I said, you know, I'm going to blame all black people? That, that would be misguided and terribly wrong. Yes, it is true. Some of the perpetrators have been black. That does not mean all black people are criminals. That's a stereotype, and we don't need to feed into that. And there are many other perpetrators who are white, and we don't usually blame all white people. These are individual wrongdoers who we should apprehend and prosecute. But while we're doing that, exactly as every speaker has said, the responsible course of action is to build bridges, knowing, yes, it's frustrating work, but it's such necessary, vital work to promote American ideals. And let's not forget, we never talk about this, which is why I always lift up this community. There are Afro-Asians. There are people who are uh, Afro-Asian, there are people who are Asian and Latino, there are people of so many different mixes, uh, and there always have been, by the way. This is not a new phenomena, and yet even within minority communities, we sometimes marginalize people, and that's just wrong. Where have the successes come from? Bridge building. The 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, which is how we got here, wouldn't have been passed if it weren't for the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So the struggle for black equality benefited everybody. And if we can return, I know it's a little bit old school, but to this spirit, this possibility of progress for individuals and for communities and see that it comes from reaching out to people who don't look like you but who share your aspirations for a better America. Again, many thanks uh, to President Daisy Coco de Filippis uh, and to Ostos Community College. It's an honor to be part of this program. Thank you, President Wu. Thank you, Executive Director Moy, for joining us today. So let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. So we, we really appreciate your support of the Asian American community and support of Hostel Community College. Thank you again. So next, uh, I want to introduce Professor Luis Alavaluz and Professor Sonia Bu, who will give us today's scholarship presentation. So I'll briefly introduce them to, to the audience. Professor, uh, Professor Lopez teaches for Hunter College. He's, spe he's specialized in Hispanic Caribbean and has publication on the Hispanic Caribbean and the 19th century in the Dominican Republic. Republic as well as on history of Latinos of the United States. He collaborated in the general histories of the Dominican People Project under the auspices of the Dominican Acad Acad Academy of History and the General Archive of the Nations. He has many, many publications. And Professor Sonia Bu, she is a community organizer and leader. She specialized in the training of leaders, development of organizations, and, and teams and systems analysis. As a community organizer, she has more than four decades using education in its broad, broad set uh, interpretation as a means and instrument to organize communities, establish institutions, and form leaders in educational, governmental, political, and nonprofit institutions. She's the member of the faculty of the Institute of Generative Leadership USA and Latin in the United States and Latin American and the Leadership Academy of New York City. She teaches at CUNY, College of New Rochelle School of New Resources and CUNY Center of Puerto Rican Studies. Welcome today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, that was those were former, I'm already retired. <laughs> Thank you. So, and it was interesting to hear uh, Dr. Wu talk about the combination. I consider myself a Black, Asian, Dominican Chinese. Uh, so yes, we come in all shapes and forms. <laughs> so thank you. Good morning, everyone, and greetings 
to our fellow panelists. Uh, it has been a pleasure and honor to just to listen to the conversation just so far. And, um, and we're here today together. Uh, I'm still emotional from the one I heard. <laughs> so please uh, bear with me a little bit. Uh, celebrating uh, the contributions and the legacy of our Asian and Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders uh, communities. Thank you, Dr. Daisy Coco de Felipe for inviting us to this panel and to you for your lovely introductions. So <clears throat> our theme today is the Chinese migration and integration to the Dominican society. This was a collaboration of Professor Luis Alvarez Lopez and myself. And our presentation today is a very brief, very brief summary of a chapter we wrote together for a book that was recently published by the Center of Caribbean Studies of the Pontificia Universidad Catholic Madre Maestra in the Dominican Republic. The project that we did, uh, the project in general was um, to study the historical and the economic impact of the Chinese presence in the Greater Caribbean. Uh, our, Luis's and I, uh, contribution was to, to, that we analyzed the second and third generations of descendants of Chinese immigrants to the Dominican Republic within the larger context of the Chinese migration to the continent of Latin America and the greater Caribbean in the 19th and 20th centuries. Perfect example of those communities that were largely in Peru, Panama, Cuba, and definitely Mexico and Puerto Rico. The areas of our investigation was, uh, we wanted to work on integration of the PCP in society. What, how this uh, immigrant community integrated to the society that was the Dominican Republic. What was the racial and ethnic, national, ethnic and national identities that emerged from that uh, integration? And also we want to talk about a little bit about the anti-Chinese stereotypes and prejudices that existed at that time and capital accumulation um, and contributions of that. Uh, community to our society in the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean. Our research question was, what has been the experience of the second generation descendant of Chinese immigrants in the Dominican society? The, the literature was limited and we hope to contribute more to the curiosity and experiment of looking into this particular group of descendants and, uh, in the Dominican Republic. The other question was, what has been the level of adaptation that they had and what contributed to it? What were and are the racial, ethnic, and national identities of the second and third generations in the Dominican Republic and abroad when they traveled? And then what have been their contributions to the Dominican market and society? Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Research, the theoretical framework and methodology. We use the theoretical framework of Alejandro Portes and his story about the economy of my immigrant group. Portes analyzed the second and third generation of migrant group and the challenges and opportunities they face. The story of migrant community allow us to understand and explain how this group managed to build capital by using the ethnic transnational network. Okay, methodology, knowledge creation, to build a matrix, to interview members of the second generation of immigrants, questionnaire design, questions that include multiple variables, targeted to the area of interest, identification of members of second generation of immigrants in the United States and also in the Dominican Republic, conduct interview, be a Zoom form or face to face. Going back to Alejandro Portes, Luis Galnizo, and Robert Bash, this scholar has been has been demonstrating the ability of migrant group to organize small businesses that provide jobs for fellow immigrants 
internally generate capital and create CACTI market in the community. Community ethnic solidarity and Chinese transnational network contributed to the creation of jobs, achieve gradual and progressive economic growth and generate capital. This produced financial sustainability for this community involve, involving the entire family in the process and also the society. One of the things that we, uh, as we heard our panelists before us, is the complexities of identity. The question of identity is multidimensional and complex, and being a Dominican Chinese uh, in the Dominican Republic did not was not assembled. So we, what we found in, from our interviews were that the first generation of Chinese, those who came directly from China, they did not seem to have or experience, at least at first glance, major difficulties with their identity. However, they did experience some part isolation because they remained in their, in their community as they expanded the possibilities for their children. Then we come to the second and third generations, and our finding was that those living in the Dominican Republic identify themselves as Dominicans. They somehow erased a little bit. The, they knew that they were racially Chinese, but when they, you ask them, how do you see or self-identify yourself racially or ethnically, they said, we are Dominican, we live here, we speak the language, we, we breathe the culture. So that was interesting for us. And some of them then later on in their lives as adults began to see themselves as bicultural and by ethnic. Later as they began gaining a more consciousness of this. The interesting thing for us as well was the second and third generation who migrated to the United States from the Dominican Republic. Then here they found all the nuances and complexities that we just spoke our panelists spoke about and began to self-identify within the confine of the racialized concept living in the United States and then began identifying themselves as Chinese Dominicans, Asian Latino or Latina, uh, Latinx is yes, the, 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 the latest uh, construct, Dominican Chinese, Chinese Dominican American. And we began to see that how in the adaptation of identification began to blend the, con the racial construction in the United States. Then we, um, we began to see what were the elements of the integration process and socialization for this second and third uh, generation uh, community. We found in our research that the Chinese migration to the greater Caribbean, Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico, Panama, uh, Peru particularly, uh, was in, in, inextricably linked to issues of race and identity as we have already identified and discrimination and resistance. So the process of the integration of these immigrants and their descendants into the receiving society is closely related to the development of their own ethnic, racial, and social identities. The public was no exception that we saw. Then we began to examine the elements that we found were contributing to that process of integration. And definitely language was one. Uh, they begin to lose and acquire the Spanish language and lose the, the Chinese. The Catholic religion definitely was a key component, a critical component in that integration. When they, meaning the first generation, begin sending their kids to be educated in the Catholic private schools, and they were baptizing their children and sometimes themselves uh, in the Catholic church. Uh, and it was interesting for us to hear the, some of the people they interviewed claim that their parents actually sought uh, Dominicans, godparents, so that they could have a better chance for integration. We also saw the role that the family played 
uh, in, in the integration and socialization. One of the things that we found was the role of the mother. He is a what do we mean by that? Uh, most of the immigrants uh, that came to, from China were males. So they began uh, marrying, uh, sorry, they began marrying Dominican women. So therefore, if the mother uh, was Dominican, most likely the, the process was faster in the integration, but the loss of the uh, Asian culture was the as well evident. On the other hand, some of them actually got married and brought their wives, very few of them. Those households had uh, mothers who were Chinese and sometimes intergenerational uh, uh, household, meaning that the grandparents from China were, were living with them. Those we found that they retained language also for a little longer than, than the previous month. And of course, uh, social mobility was different uh, that the parents uh, had, they were no longer in the business or they were lawyers and, and uh, professors, historians. However, uh, because it was limited, uh, our research, we want to expand it to see is that true to to other part of the of that community that we may not have research. Like for myself, I know that my parents were more working class. That's what I that is what I describe with my from my interviewees. So that was interesting. And then their friends began to be uh, Dominicans primarily, and Dominican uh, Chinos were pr primarily reserved for their family. The preservation of the Chinese language did not manage to be maintained in the majority of the second generation of the interviewees, even though in some cases both parents were Chinese. The third generation had no command of the Chinese language in the general sense. The Chinese language, whether it was Cantonese or Mandarin, was not transmitted in most cases to the descendants. Many of the second generation, already adults, have a desire and interest to learn the Chinese language. Some try but few may that wish in reality give it the difficulty of learning the Chinese language as adults in a context where there is no possibility of practicing it frequently, right? Uh, the attempt was more of a nostalgic gesture to connect with, his, with their ancestors. Incorporation to the labor market. Chinese immigrants in the Dominican Republic generate capital different from the Chinese migrant group in Mexico and Cuba, yes. In the case of the Dominican, in the case of Mexico and Cuba, we have one, two important elements. Number one, that was a migration from the United States, especially from California, of Chinese immigrants with some resources, some capital, that invest in the Chinese community of both places. That was one important element. A second important element was that some American company invest in the Chinese community. They loan uh, resources to the, to the Chinese welcome. And that way, that, that situation was totally different to the case of the Dominican Republic. We don't have any Chinese uh, from California in the Dominican Republic experience. But how they generate capital in the Dominican Republic? Individual and family work, saving and investment, self-financing, long between family and friends, and some, some Chinese immigrants imported capital from China. A few of them were professional in China and were able to import some capital from China to start in the Dominican Republic. That was the case. Anti-Chinese sentiment and prejudice in the Dominican Republic. In Dominican folklore, there is some evidence of exclusionary behavior and language against the Chinese. But the most important element seen to us is the racist legislation and anti-Chinese behavior and sentiment don't seem to be present in the Dominican Republic until the decree 168 something. This decree wasn't was a legislation approved by the 
Supreme Court first. For the Supreme Court, there was a legislation that basically uh, prohibited, closed the door of the Dominican citizenship for Haitian immigrants. With, the, with the, the idea that the Haitian citizen already, the Haitian immigrant in the Dominican Republic already have a Haitian citizenship. Clear, they, they, were, they, were, they were not living in Haiti, they were living in the Dominican Republic. And so in some way we have to study this issue a little deeper to understand how this legislation impact the Chinese community. And finally, I'm going to make a couple of comments here. A couple of comments that we need to, to the story deeper. One of them is the relationship, the relationship between the Dominican, the Chinese community, and also the role of the Chinese community in the issue between Taiwan and also China. As you know, the Dominican government recently opened relationship with China. But the relationship historically has been with Taiwan. Taiwan has been the instrument to invest a million of dollars in the Dominican Republic. Um, China just started um, becoming an important member, in, important member in the Chinese community and in the country in general. China today is the third business partner of the Dominican Republic. The first one is United States, the second one is Haiti, and the third business partner is China. Let's see how that situation play in the geopolitical of the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you to Daisy and thank you all the panelists. Thank you so much, Luis and Sonia. Such a Thank you for giving us such a wonderful presentation about this unique uh, community and share the, the experiences and their value. I found this topic very fascinating. Uh, so I want to open the floor to the audience. Uh, if you have any question for Luis and Sonia. Mm -hmm. I actually do have one question. Um, so um, so what, during your interview, what are the similarities and differences between uh, Chinese and American cultures to, to the interview is share with you. Some of, some of the uh, differences, Similar. which is which is not necessarily a big difference, but it was a perception that again, uh, whatever what Chinese had super smart. Again, it's a stereotype that is that follows our Asian community. Uh, the idea definitely food was different. And the language was the primary uh, giveaway in terms of, of, of how they integrated or not. Some, some of the interviewees, I recall, uh, that she talked about how she lived two worlds. When she got home, because she lived in an intergenerational household, she spoke Chinese at home, was like being in a Chinese culture, she stepped out of it and went to school and entered the, entered the world of the Dominican. So she left in both. And I think that in the United States, what happened is when some of them immigrated here, some of them went to Washington Heights in, the, in, in as Dominicans, or they went to Chinatown, and others just went into whatever they were not necessarily identifying with either communities. Luis, you want you have anything else you want to add? See, one, one last comment I just want to emphasize is that strike me a lot. What the, the strong interest of the first generation of Chinese immigrants to edu educate the second and third generation in the Dominican Republic. They, in reality, the, when you look the second generation, definitely you see some type of upward mobility. They became more educated, they became totally integrated into the Dominican society, play an important role in the Dominican society today. But what the first generation commitment to education, a very important point in that situation. So, uh, so Sonia and Luis, uh, I know that you know many of us want to learn more about this topic, and I know I do. So if you have any uh, materials or links you can share with us about your work, you know, please email to uh, Diana so we can distribute it to the audience. Thank you so much again. Uh, so President, uh, do you want to uh, share your closing remarks? 
Well, the one thing I take away from this, first of all, thank you. Really powerful, beautiful. Number one, this distinction that became much more prevalent is in the United States, that all of a sudden you're not Dominican, you know, you because whether we're all Dominicans, whatever, Haitian, whatever, right? But here is the Chinese Dominican, whatever. That's one thing. The other thing is that any law, what we have seen, the laws that discriminate against one group ultimately end up discriminating against all others. Uh, and that has been the case with that particular law that you pointed out to Luis as well. So it is common cause. I know I know that was re-emphasized throughout by multiple panelists in my introduction, I said it. We share so much, you know, we, and this is just why I reached out immediately as a college president, when these things were beginning to happen, I said, we have to do something here because we cannot be silent. And so I'm very happy you join us. I hope you can come back in future events with more updates. Really love having you all. I mean, I thought they were so, so powerful. Eric, the questions and, and provost, uh, Shai Kui, uh, beautiful, beautiful probing. I much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and great moderation. You know, thank you so much. Um, no, I, I think it's all been said by our panelists and, uh, and you and the president. So unless there are any further comments, I think that is the end of the program. All right. So thank you. Thank, thank you, so president. Much. Thank you, Luis, Sonia. Thank Bye. you so much. And uh, good